Hey everyone. Um, so I haven't done a lot of um, YouTube stuff. Um, I see from my channel I've done some like stuff here and there, but I've decided to like um, actually start doing something with my channel. So um, right now um, I've just had I've kind of been getting the typology and, and whatnot. So I decided I would probably like read from this book here, Personology by Kersey. By the way, Jeff, is this backwards in the camera? <laughs> Not for me. Okay, good. Because it's showing a mirror image in my screen. Okay, so this is Jeff uh, S. B. Spaz, and he's done you know a lot of stuff on typology in the past. Not as much recently. Yeah, I was about but... to say I've done a lot of stuff on YouTube, but though recently it's been less to do with typology, but yeah, but still quite a lot of videos. Yeah. And before that, a few years ago, um, back when I was fatter, uh, I did a bunch of typology videos including a bunch of like interactions with various other types so if you want to check out the sp spaz on youtube you can see plenty of those or or my, my more recent stuff when i've yeah, talked a lot more about like um you know diets and weight loss stuff because you know that's been more important to me yeah yeah i need to uh get more in shape and uh so i was like we were all rare enough to go to the gym, and then the quarantine happened, and it was like, ugh. At least we don't have to pay for our membership while it's going on. But see, the good thing about that for me is that I never liked going to gym. Period. So for me, just doing a workout at home was what I already preferred. So right. it's been no different for me. I, yeah. In fact, I, I I got into actually uh started doing a workout I did uh, ten years ago and had some success with. It's in this book right here. Okay. Called the testosterone advantage, um, yeah. and uh, so I'm like uh, about four weeks into that, which is like a nine-week weightlifting plan, and I can you, you can do the whole thing with dumbbells at home. So cool. I'm not sure we have dumbbells around here. We'll check that out. Uh, we used to have. Um, um, yeah, not to be like a, a shill for them or anything, because they don't pay me. But I got <laughs> the Bowflex adjustable dumbbells, like you know, 10 years ago when I first did this mm -hmm. and they are still working great today. So cool. the, I don't remember exactly what I spent on, but it was probably in the 300 range. And at the mm. time, you know, that was quite an investment for me, but it really has paid off. Cause like I said, they work yeah. just as good now as they did 10 years ago. And I've, and I, it's not like I did it 10 years ago and then I set them on a shelf for 10 years. I mean, I've used them from time to time over yeah. the years. And well, you're so, looking great. I mean, yeah, seriously. So, that's a good advertisement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's sometimes you see those things on TV and it's like, oh, you know, is this going to be yeah, exactly. some garbage thing they're trying to sell for whatever. And, and really, no, for the price and what I've gotten out of it, it's actually been a really good value. Cool. Uh, I wonder if the... Let's see, one thing I'm thinking is... I think it's going to keep my, um, my video as kind of tiny the whole time but that's okay I, you can be the the star <laughs> probably not because it's not tiny for me so i would imagine well, it probably um well it's capturing my show. my program uh oh you're like, just on like my screen end, recording so. it or something yeah uh, i don't have any of that work so <laughs> so i'm just figuring out the kinks here but let's see okay can, that? can i do the window uh, yeah it's all right i'll, I'll figure it out some other Skype. time so i don't know yeah it's, it's, it's all good. All right. Um, okay. So, yeah. Basically, we're going to keep try to keep it kind of short. Cause, uh, but I had to do a little something while I'm in quarantine because, like, can't get out. And I just want to, like, connect to the broader world a little bit. And this is taking my interest a little bit. And so Jeff likes to kind of give concrete examples and talk about it on a real – um, everyday type of level, and um, I like that too. So um, hopefully this will be good for a, lot, a wide range of people who don't necessarily get deep into theory, but they just want to kind of understand the differences between people and and um, and all that. So I'm going to read just a little bit here, and then we'll just talk about it and, and riff off of it a little bit. Just whatever strikes our fancy. And uh, this was all spontaneous, by the way. So we're both artisans. I'm ESCP and a promoter, and then uh, Jeff is ESFP performer. And so I just decided, <laughs> I just 
I talked about it before, but I was just like, hey, are you available now? You know, so when you when we read about the artisans, yeah. that's, that's pretty much the way I did all my interactions too, because yeah. they always, I'd say, what's a good time for you? And half the time they'd be like, well, you know, I don't know, it could be this, whatever, or they, or they schedule a time and then tell me, well, can we do it later? Because this, and I. And I've said, for me, it's like the longer, the more something is scheduled and the longer it's scheduled, the more it starts to feel like an obligation instead of just yeah. something fun to do. Exactly. So there were actually times where I had, in fact, scheduled like a video interaction, you know, just for fun, not some work-related thing. Yeah. But as I got closer to the time, the less I wanted to do it because yeah. I was like, it felt like it felt like it was work, you know, like yeah. this thing coming up that was scheduled instead of just being like, hey, you want to just jump on and, you know, talk about whatever, you know, so that, yeah, that's a much better for me. So, and now I would just want to thought off of this a little bit. My wife is an ISFJ protector. And so you have to tell her way ahead of time uh, or else it's kind of like just sudden and it just, you know, sprung on her. And so, um, but if you tell her like a day in advance or maybe even a few hours, then she kind of gets used to it. And then if, if like, say, she, okay, so she really likes spending time with me, but if I'm, was planning to do something like go out with friends or something like that, and I end up not doing it, she's kind of like, well, now it's kind of weird because you were supposed to, and I was planning to do this and watch this movie and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, so yeah. it's like, it has to be settled for her. For me, it's more fun if it's just spur of the moment. Yeah, uh, my mother is an INFJ, yeah. a counselor idealist, and we are, when it comes to that sort of thing, we are complete opposites, Yeah, and to the point where we've actually, like, had, I mean, real fights over those issues because, <laughs> because of our difference in that area, and, you know, just as an example, I gave this in another video I did where you know, sh when I'm visiting her, uh, where she lives in San Antonio, she'll come up to me and ask me, like, do you want to go to such and such restaurant? Like, she's heard about some new restaurant, or she has a coupon for it, or whatever mm -hmm. the deal is. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good, sure. Yeah. And if that would be the end of it for me. Yeah. But then she's like, well, we also could, and then she gives me like six or seven other choices <laughs> when I already agreed to the first one. <laughs> But see, the, then the thing is, is like, if I'm like, okay, yeah, the first one was fine. Even if I change my mind and go with the third one, whatever, whatever it is, it's like once there's a conclusion there, for her, that's the end of it. Yeah. Whereas then when I'm the one driving and I start driving and then I see something on the way where I'm like, well, man, that looks pretty good. Maybe we should go there. Like, I enjoy doing that. Like, that is thrilling for me to drive, to, to find that place. So she hates that. Because yeah. it's like, we had decided on this place, <laughs> and now it like actually sends her into a panic. Yeah. Like if you take off driving, and you and and she's one of those people. If you, she doesn't know exactly where we're going, she will start mm -hmm. like panicking there in the vehicle that somehow we're just gonna like drive into hell or something. <laughs> you know. And I have said many times, not just to her, but to to all the J's that I have had this conflict with. <laughs> I'm like, there is no road that leads directly into hell. Like, even <laughs> even if we have to just turn around and go back the way we came, we will find yeah, our way back, you know. <laughs> and some people just, they just can't operate that way. Well, so you know, it's like, for me, not knowing where I'm going makes it more exciting. Like, yeah. that actually makes it more interesting. Whereas, for her, that's like a reason to panic. You know, actually, it, it's kind of funny, though, because... Um, <laughs> for me, I had a moment where, you know, I'm, I'm highly spontaneous. I love just for the moment stuff. But at the same time, it's like one time I freaked out because so my wife is driving and all of a sudden she just starts driving down the road. Not we don't know where we don't know where we're going. And the map, you know, isn't Google Maps isn't running or anything like that. And so I was just like, what the heck are you doing right now? And I realized later it's because it freaked me out that she was doing that because I want to be the spontaneous one and because <laughs> I'm a directive type, I like to kind of direct the flow of it. And for me, for someone to like direct the flow and I don't know what they're doing, that kind of freak, like can freak me out a little bit depending. Well, but, it probably would freak me out a little bit if my mother did that just because yeah. I would think has she now officially gone senile because it's so <laughs> unusual for her that, and, and like I said, the last time we were there, 
part of, you know, now it's like she's older, she's lost some of her hearing. And yeah. so sometimes conflicts like escalate because of that, because she misunderstood something I said. Yeah. And the last time we had this fight and it was basically the gist of it was really stupid if you break it down, because it was like after I don't know how many times that we've gone down there, my, you know, my brothers, my son and, and me. Um, and there's been times where there's like leftover food and, you know, all of the other people in the house, in the place besides her are perceiver types, you know, and mm -hmm. we just, we're like, man, yeah, we just feel like going out and getting some food. Yeah. And she'll always complain that we don't eat the leftovers. Yeah. That there's these perfectly good food and we yeah. go out and get something else. And so, like, the last time I was there, it was just me, my son, and her. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to finally, like, honor her wish and just have the leftovers. And when I told her that, she said that I had ruined all her plans. <laughs> because she had planned for me to take her out that night or whatever. So it was just like, that was a little too much for me. I just, I kind of went off because I'm like, all these times that you got on us for doing this, and then I finally say, okay, I'm going to do it this time, and you're like, you've ruined everything. I'm like, nice. come on. Yeah, because she's, uh, she would be a directive type too, so that would probably, and I know a couple INFJs, and they're very kind of direct, and they, they like to kind of direct the flow of what's going on as well. And she's really good at it in a lot yeah. of ways. Uh and so many things I'm thankful for, for yeah. when we were kids, and she was always the one responsible for sort of organizing trips, mm -hmm. vacations, and things like that, you know, when we got a chance to do it. The only exception was, like, if it was, like, a camping, fishing type thing, my dad would, would do that. But mm -hmm. if it was, like, any kind of thing where we were staying in a motel or, you know, going to, like, uh, theme parks or anything like that we got a chance to do, she was so good at being able to budget the time and plan all that stuff That's and cool. even have sort of contingency plans for like, if something what didn't work, we had another option. Yeah. And then we took for granted the amount of fun we got to have just because she was prepared for these things. And I learned that the hard way, the first time that I took my son to Disney world when he was like six or seven, mm -hmm. because that was like the most planning I had ever done for something like that. Yeah. Uh, and it still was pretty overwhelming. <laughs> and I, I, that was not like I didn't already somewhat appreciate it, but that was the point in which, like, okay, I was like, yeah, she actually went through a lot of trouble because she had three kids. And sometimes her husband, you know, uh, they got divorced when I was 13. But, um, but uh, you know, some of the time where she was organizing all this stuff for all of us and, and taking and factoring in the differences where we all weren't necessarily wanting to do the same thing at the same time and nice. that kind of stuff, you know. So it's it's not that's a, almost like an idealist thing, isn't it? To factor in all the different um, kind of things that uh, that almost seemed, struck me that way, like because an idealist likes to to uh, kind of emphasize the uniqueness of each person, right? Yeah, part of it. I th I think guardians will take that into account, but it's right. kind of like uh, there's still sort of a well. Ultimately, you you need to get with the program right, that I'm setting. Exactly. So I think, yeah, idealists tend to, they care more about, like, is this something that's going to somehow um, engender growth in the person or whatever, especially yeah. in children. You know, it's like, this is this going to be an educational experience or something that they, you know, they'll, that really allows them to thrive some way in their element. So this is like just a good conversation in itself, even though we spent like, uh, I guess it's like about half the time now. But this is pretty awesome right now, right here, what we're doing, even without getting into the book. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, I, I've done a lot of that just because it's like the examples in life are just so abundant. To oh, me. yeah. And it's like, like I said, lately I really haven't even been that into typology. It's not been something where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, personality types. Like, and not really that often. It's more like I enjoy talking to people. Yeah. And... I see the evidence of this everywhere in terms of it just, I, it's just such a part of life and, and what I observe of people that it's like hard. I, it basically, if I, if, I, if I wanted to ignore it, I would just be going to an effort to ignore it. Yeah. And there's no reason to do that. So <laughs> yeah. it's like a tool in the toolbox when, especially when it comes to like communication with people, because you can so quickly sort of break down some of those communication barriers. Mm -hmm. And especially um, with, 
you know, just again, as one that one type is an example, the, the idealists, uh, especially the counselors, because my mother and I had a good friend and coworker for a while, it was another counselor idealist. And when we first met or when we first started working together, I mean, you wouldn't have thought there could be two possible different people, like more different people. And like, and the conversations we had were like, not like we were fighting all the time, but they were like brief, keep it business kind of like, you know, there was always that wall we would hit in communication, like really mm-hmm. quickly. Once, like I introduced the concept of temperament to her, and, you know, that wasn't really, you know, it was around the time I was sort of getting into some of that stuff myself. And the more that we talked about it, like it became a deal where we were like realizing we were, we were at the office still like an hour and a half after we were supposed to leave work because nice. we were having a conversation so long about it. She actually had like relatives that would, that, that her mother actually came in the office to talk to me about her husband, <laughs> like because he's like an ISFP or something. And she wanted like advice on like how nice. to talk to him about certain things. <laughs> so it's pretty funny, like how it, came, it went from, you know, us just barely speaking to each other, uh, you know, again, not in a hostile way, but it just, we felt like we had nothing in common and it was, there was nothing yeah. there really to having these extremely long conversations and like feeling like both of us not only gain knowledge about each other, but about like a bunch of other people in our life. Yeah. So, Cool. So what, what type was this coworker you were talking about? Uh, another counselor idealist. Okay, yeah, yeah. I thought that's it. Yeah. Cool. All right. And so, yeah, and by, by consequence, you know, I feel like I learned more about my mother, you know, despite obviously knowing her all my life from talking to this coworker. Mm-hmm. And she felt like she learned more about her relatives, you know, that were like artisan types, especially from talking yeah. to me. So. Nice. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I just felt like talking about artist temperament, but I almost um, wondered if maybe we should just talk about temperament in general. But um, what would you prefer to do? Because uh, I could go. Well, as you pointed out, I believe before we started recording, artisan is the best temperament. So that's right. Yes. It's obviously the one we can spend the most time talking about. <laughs> but, um, it is what we know, know the best from the inside out. So. But we uh, can obviously, you know, in a, at a future time, revisit the subject in whatever way you want yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. So. I guess it doesn't too. matter too much, but cool. Okay, so there's a part in the beginning where Kirsty talks about uh, the, the temperaments in brief, and then he goes into them in further depth later on. So I'll read just like the first paragraph. So and you can break in if you want, but um, I'll just read the first paragraph here. It's the section of adapting to circumstances, because artisans and rationals are utilitarian, and guardians and idealists are uh, compliant. And I can explain that more at a a different time, but um, this paragraph paragraph will be basically self-explanatory. Tactical manipulators. Choosing adaptive necessity over conventional nicety makes a whopping difference in artisan willingness to do what they have to to get what they want. It not only makes the getting easier, but more fun. And down the line, it has shown that artisans are into fun more than anything else. This does not mean that their action whether instrumental or interpersonal, is never compliant with conventions, customs, or traditions. Nor does it mean that their word use is never abstract, nor their tool use never complex. Indeed, at times their action does comply with norms, but they are not nearly as nicety governed as they are necessity governed. It's a matter of priority and therefore of habit, and since they tend to have few doubts about anything, they certainly have no doubts about either their priorities or their habits. Surely, once they latch onto a habit of talking in a certain way or moving in a certain way, they are likely to hang on to it for a long time. It is their concrete use of words and their simple use of tools that enable them to see to it that devices are crafted, schemes promoted, displays performed, and tales composed. Now, let me, I want to say something, because I know you uh, will probably have a lot to say, but I want to break in here with, (laughs) because once you get going, it's hard to stop. Always. (laughs) (laughs) I want to say something about that when it says um, that it's not that artisans never um, go along, you know, and are are compliant. Um, Now, a little bit about my life. And I I did an interview with um, Zach Van Houten, uh, uh, I think Living the Path uh, podcast, just the other day. But... um, I didn't get a chance to go into my life and, um, on a broader level, but um, basically, when I was growing up, I wasn't like, 
um, a troublemaking pet. Like a lot of artisans, they're you know, uh, it's kind of typified they're they make trouble and whatnot. I was a pretty good kid, but um, I was stubborn sometimes. But at the same time, I love I love to have fun. But I kind of grew, grew up in a little bit of a bubble. But I kind of went along with um, you know things for a while, and then like in high school, I ended up just kind of getting into punk rock, and it was like Christian punk rock. <laughs> I grew up in a Christian household. But um, <laughs> I did a lot of things like um, I just started dressing like a punk, and it wasn't just like skater punk. It was like kind of grungy, like um, sort of, you know, cutoffs and stuff. Like I, I remember, you know, we were kind of poorer, but um, we would shop at Goodwill a lot, and that's kind of what um, my crowd did too. So it was just like, um, <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, if you get into hip hop, you have to like buy the latest Nikes or whatever, or whatever. And it's like, it gets expensive, but it's like, it was kind of convenient because I just go to go to Goodwill and uh, my mom bought me a pair of slacks and I just cut them off. Like it was kind of below the knees because there was a skater influence and all that. And uh, then I even like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, this is kind of a, a bygone age when we used to do this, but like. Um, sew zippers into the knees and like put patches on them and, and whatnot. And uh, I remember my aunt came over um, to visit, and uh, she was a missionary to, I to Ireland. I think she was in Iceland at that point. But um, <clears throat> but anyway, she was like visiting with us, and uh, my mom was like, "Yeah, he just like got these nice new pair of pants, and he just cut them." I just can't believe it. my mom's an ESFJ, so it just <laughs> it just freaked her out. And I remember because I'm one time I was watching uh, you remember G Rock, Jeff? I don't know if you ever watched that show. It was on TBN, but it was like a Christian skater punk show, basically. You know, I have a vague memory of that. I might have seen that. I tried I tried doing tricks on skateboards, but it never quite I never quite got the hang of it. <laughs> Couldn't even ollie, but I loved. Uh, skateboarding when I could and I watched the shows and they, they would like do all these wild tricks on um on the uh you know the, the banisters and whatnot and like just out in the street and whatnot and my mom was like and it was just like hardcore you know like <sighs> like music and my mom was like when you were growing up I never thought you'd get into this <laughs> but anyway so she was just freaking out about the fact that I did this kind of stuff and my aunt just she was normally like so nice and sweet and everything, but she just tried to be like, Justin, like, and she, <laughs> I, it was at that moment I realized, wow, I'm like really bucking the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, another thing too, that was really illustrative. So my dad is an ENTJ, Phil Marshall, right? And so he, he was always very deep and complex and everything. And I remember um, this was like the end of my freshman year. Um, uh, some some kids like kind of invited me to hang out with them and stuff, and I was like, you know, I want to I want to get colored hair. Oh, I think it was probably in, the, in my sophomore year, but anyway, I told my parents, and uh, I was like, I want to just like, you know, my hair like multicolored, you know, and just like go all out and everything. And uh, my dad just took me into his room. He was like, son, he's like, what's going on? Are you having an identity crisis? And I'm like. No, I just want to do it because it's fun. <laughs> and I was like, "What is this? All this thing about all this stuff about identity crisis? What are you talking about?" <laughs> and it was like that. That's just so funny because neither of our parents are artisans, so they don't understand that kind of thing. You know, like to them, it's just kind of like, "Why are you doing all this?" Like we we grew up during the hippie era. We never felt the need to get involved in all that and stuff. And I'm like, "Well, I do." So. <laughs> Why can't I just, you know, and I remember too, one time my dad was driving me up to school. And so my friend, he's called Casey the Punk, and he was the one who put all the shows together. I think he was probably an ESTP or maybe an ISTP, but he was like really good at promoting shows and stuff. And, um, but he had, he just went all out with ripped like cutoffs and, and, uh, just spray paint all over his shorts and, and stuff i never went up that far he, he he actually made me a pair like that but um i never really wore them that much but um 
he just like looked totally raggedy and patches everywhere, multicolored hair, and he had to put a wig on for for school. But <laughs> as he was walking up to the doors, um, my dad was like, if he was wise, he would know that dressing like that makes one seem like a drug addict or something like that. And I was like, oh, come on. Seriously? <laughs> but there was that total misunderstanding, that total gap there um, where I, I kind of understand, like, if I can try to put myself in the shoes of the their generation and everything and look at it that way. But, I mean, s still, like, that had been around since the 80s, too. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, but I always had that kind of tension of, like, trying to break out of that box. And I also wanted to, like, um, you know, show that Christian Christianity can, can be cool. Like, not just, like, in the youth pastor, like, yeah, rad, man, you know, kind of way. But, like, actually break outside of that, like, kind of con tight little box and whatnot. And um, so to me, when I was kind of, you know, in my teen years and then afterward, there's always been that underlying desire to to give a different image to things. And that kind of goes with the promoter personality. It's like you want to be able to advertise in a way, not, not that it's like deceptive, but that gives a different angle on things, you know, that, that you can persuade people that it's not all lame and that you have a different way of presenting things, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, anything that comes to your mind when it, from that paragraph or anything I said? Well, yeah, I, I think that I just was thinking as you read that, that it's just, just really well put because, um, and to me is, even as just that paragraph is like the defense for when I see people online who bash Kersey and say, well, mm -hmm. he just like perpetuates stereotypes or behavior right. or whatever, because right there in that you read that he's saying that I'm not saying yeah. that everybody like exactly. the artisan is just some wild creature that can't possibly <laughs> follow any rules or do it, you know, right. or have any morals or anything like that. And I understand the tendency of people to get that feeling when they read for initial profiles and stuff. Yeah. I did, too, the first time yeah. I encountered it when I was, like, 20 years old. Um, I remember reading, you know, uh, the original Please Understand Me mm -hmm. and the description of, I think he called it, like, the Dionysian mm -hmm. temperament or something like that. Um, the God of Wine. Because, yeah, in the original book, they were, like, based on, like, Greek gods or something, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yeah. Which I think, thankfully, he went away from that a little, a later on. It was yeah. a little bit kind of out there. But, uh, you know, I guess it appeals to somebody who's just really into mythology. But um, anyway, uh, when I read those initial descriptions where it was basically like, this is these are the people who do things just for the sake of the action, I didn't think I was one of those either because I wanted to believe at 20 years old. I wanted to believe, oh, yeah, I've got this higher purpose and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm deeper than that, and so misunderstood, and all this yeah. stuff. You know, I wanted to have that image of myself, but it's like the older I got, and the more I really, you know, really became honest about myself, the more I was like, yeah, I mean, that was me all along. I just yeah. was in denial because I didn't want because I got that initial image of those type of people that I had gone to high school with that, that all they cared about is like. Oh man, I'm gonna get so wasted this weekend, man. And, <laughs> totally. and man, last week I got so wasted, man, I threw up so much, it was great. And I'm just like, who is, loser. What kind of moron is like, this is totally. your life? And those are yeah. the people that I thought of when I read that kind of thing. You yeah. Know? And what I had to realize is that some of those people, yeah, they are also artisans. But that's just like they're just like a drop in the bucket of all of the people right. that en encompass that. And plenty of those people were not artisans. Uh, a lot of them mm -hmm. were guardians, just desperate to fit in exactly. and belong to whatever group was popular. Yeah. And if going out and getting drunk was the popular thing, then that's exactly. what they were going to do because they wanted to fit into the group. You yeah. know. So there's a lot of there's a lot more subtlety to it. And when you read something like personality, if you really read it and you um you think about what these things mean, you know, in terms of how they reflect in reality and all of the, the different types of people, then you, you don't see it that way. And honestly, I think 
artisans are like the most individualistic type. Yeah. And I think that actually allows us to understand that concept better because we're always sort of naturally seeing the outliers and the anomalies. And we want to be that ourselves because it's like we don't want to be kept in a box and and categorized like, oh, you're one of these, this group X, therefore you're (laughs) going to do action Y. That's like our immediate instinct is to not do that action because we don't want to fit into what somebody is saying about it. I have this little story about that. Um, I was totally like that. I always wanted to be the, the weird kid, especially because we moved around a lot. And so I already was kind of on the outside. And so I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just own it then. You know, I'll be the outsider and the, the crazy one. But um, yeah, and then there was one time where I was at a show. And so my friend Casey, you know, was there and we were doing this thing or they were doing this thing where they would go up to the steps of the stage and they would just like kind of do this twirl motion off of it and this is a fun little thing and, and like for some reason i keep thinking of this because it was like why did i do this i, I just when it was my turn i just didn't do it and it like for me like that would have been a fun thing to do but at the same time i was like man i'm just gonna be one of them like just you know, like do what everybody else is doing like no like i'm not I'm just gonna copy everybody and i, I just like it's sometimes those little moments stick with you a little bit because it's like why did I just not do that? You know, because I was kind of split because, like, it's it's a fun thing to do. But at the same time, I don't want to just do what everybody else is doing. So, yeah, I totally get, get what you're saying. And it's like, um, I had, like, I've talked about this a lot. I had an idealist phase as well. I remember you talking about this on a video I was watching today, actually, with, uh, I think it was David Kersey Jr. And it was like, um, yeah, I, I totally thought I was an idealist as well. And, um, but... Now, like, I think when we're younger, we're, we're still kind of settling in. We're still in flux and whatnot. What we settle in more as we grow, grow older. And now I can't even, like, really bend that way. And so you really compare yourself against others when you're older. Like, my idealist friends, like, I am not at that place. Like, I, I just, you know, sometimes them and rationals as well. They get going about abstract topics and they build abstraction upon abstraction. And they totally lose me. And I'm just like... Wow, I remember I used to be able to talk more about that stuff, but I just can't do that anymore. Like yeah, that. and the, the irony of that is it seems like so many people, you know, whether it's through going to college or just, you know, whatever they get into as young adults, that seems to be the age where people are introduced to the concept of typology. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's the age where everybody is sort of discovering themselves and yeah. their identity and those things. And so, I can understand why a lot of people would um, read those things and and identify with the more idealistic, abstract types because it's like there's stuff in there about, you know, all this stuff about searching for yourself and yeah. the deeper meaning of things, whatever. Yeah. And, and people kind of look at, they read the descriptions of the sensor types and they're kind of like, they think it sounds more shallow or boring. Or, mm-hmm. You know, it's especially like, there are things I like about the MBTI, but one of the problems with it and why I think Kersey's work <coughs> is superior overall mm-hmm. is because by focusing on temperament, you see the distinction between artisans and guardians mm-hmm. where with the MBTI kind of lumps the sensor types together yeah. when you have a, a, you know, an assessment that gives people choices that's like, would you prefer to use the tried and true method or <laughs> something new and innovative? I mean, I hate what that. SP type is going to say, oh, yeah, I want to do the old boring yeah. way of, you know, it's like that's not no, how we exactly. think. So a bunch of mistakes. It's not surprising at all yeah. that a lot of SPs will end up scoring as ends on the MBTI because they don't want to have the image of I'm going to do this yeah. predictable, boring, you know, there's, thing. There's, there's, but if you word things in a way where you talk about like, okay, here's the actual situation you're in, you know, what are you doing? You know, if you go into a club, are you like looking around the room, taking in the sights and sounds, or are you thinking about, you know, struggling refugees in Albania? And the truth is that most artisan types, when they go into a place, they're like, we're instantly like looking around, seeing all of these things and sort of taking in through our senses. And again, to to kind of use the flip side of that, 
I'm not saying that in types will just stumble around in some sort of haze, <laughs> like they can't, you know, know what they're, yeah. what's going on or where they're going. But the instincts are different, and I've seen this demonstrated in very real terms. I have one brother who is an artisan type, and one brother that's a rational type. Yeah. And there was a time where both were visiting me, and we went into a, a burrito place called Freebird. And they were one of those places with a lot of decorations on the walls, on the tables. You know, there's a bunch of people make things out of the foil they wrap the burritos mm -hmm. in, and they put them all over the place. And there's a lot of uh, attractive young women there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like my brother and I, it's like my younger brother and I, the artisan brother, and I walk in, and it's like I, I see him looking at the same things I'm looking at. Yeah. Like, we can't help but notice these things. Yeah. We're having a conversation with our other brother while we're doing this, but we're noticing all these things and looking yeah. around, and that's making the biggest impact on us. So the conversation we had going into the place sort of becomes secondary. You know, we're doing mm -hmm. a lot of more of a uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. sir, while, yeah, yeah, while yeah. our rational brother is still talking. If you had asked him right then, like if you closed his eyes and, and you know, and said, describe what's around you in this building, he wouldn't be able to do it. Wow. because. He was there physically, yeah. but he, he was talking about whatever subject, you know, that he was talking about. And that's where his focus and energy was. Yeah. He's not, you know, he's barely, he's taking in enough of the physical surroundings to keep himself from like falling on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> staying, walking and staying in the line, right. but he's not looking around the room. He's not in any way like being affected by the physical environment. Man. You know, obviously, if he walked in and it was boiling hot or super cold or something, you know, there's things that can break through that. Yeah. But in general, it's like he's entirely for any and many times he said, like when he was riding in the car somewhere, like and we drove somewhere, he wasn't paying any attention to what was outside the car. Yeah. If you had asked him to give you directions on how to get back the way we came, he would have no clue. Mm -hmm. You know, he relies a lot on technology, you know, GPS type stuff, to give mm -hmm. him directions, which is obviously a lot of people do. Yeah. But I mean that would be completely necessary for him. Whereas I can't help most of the time if there's, if there are windows, if there is a way to look at the surroundings, yeah. like I'm always doing it. Yeah. And not just when I'm driving, when I'm a passenger, I do the same thing today. I had my car was in the shop and I had someone give me a ride. And to the point where I'm looking at the same things I would be looking at if I was driving as if I had to, like, it's mm -hmm. like such instinct to me. Yeah. That I'm thinking of, OK, you know, like how car, far is that car away from me? Like in a way, like I'm having to decide how to make these turns or whatever. And I'm not even the one driving. Like yeah. I don't have to know any of those things, but it's just so instinctual for me that I'm just scanning always, no matter how interesting the conversation is. Yeah, I, I think also uh, because our that's where our mental focus is that we probably see um, in even more vivid detail. Um, because I've, I've noticed, because I've been in phases where um, I got kind of got depressed and dragged down by the world, and I retreated within a little bit, and I noticed my attention wasn't as um, focused on the outer world. But then I came back out of that, and it's like, when I step outside, I'm just like, in the sun is shining, even when it's not, I'm just looking out the window right now, and it's like, I can see all little leaves on the trees across the street, and I'm just like, it's just amazing to be like, oh, this is so cool. Like even just walking down the street and looking at the flowers and stuff, I'm like, this is just so like, how can you not be captivated? You know, like that that feels like a poor existence to me to not, you know, yeah, be captivated by I, that stuff. I was listening to, I can't remember if it was on a podcast or, or YouTube video, but because there's somebody that I follow that has both, but she was talking about. Um, she was talking about walking various places mm -hmm. and uh, not having, like, keeping one earbud in to what she was listening to while she was walking and one out because yeah. so that so that she would be aware of, um, like, certain sounds or things that happened that, that, you know, she might need to be aware of, like somebody coming up behind her or things like that. Anyway, she was trying to be practical about it. But one of the things she mentioned was talk, talking about walking in the woods. And she's like, well, you know, a big branch could fall on me or whatever. And, and I'm thinking, <laughs> my immediate in, thought was, why would you have earbuds if you're walking in the woods? Aren't I know, in the right? woods to experience yeah, totally. the woods? Yeah. Like, if I walked in the woods, I'm like, I want to be part of the woods. I want to, yeah. like, see oh, and yeah. hear and feel. And so, 
Like, I'm not going to be, like, listening to something else if I'm walking in the woods. You know? that's, that's another thing I want to talk earbud, about. Earbud, like, li- you know, listening to something is for when you're walking someplace boring where there's not really much to see, you yeah. know, or hear or, or do whatever, you know. That's one, one thing I want to talk about real quick. Uh, I want to try to wrap it up, but um, this is a really deep one here. But um, I'm really oh. reading in, <laughs> uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's The Weight of Glory. And he says, um, there, the new the pages of the New Testament wrestle with the idea that one day we may enter into nature and be like basically one with it or something like that. I give the quote, mm-hmm. uh, maybe in the description, but it's like, for me, it's almost like, is that maybe just a psychological sort of orientation? Because for me, when I'm walking around, like in the woods or something like that, I feel like I'm one with it. Like I'm just, like you said, you're one with the woods. And it's like, when I'm alone and just walking, I feel like I don't feel like this introspective sense of self. I'm just like absorbed by my environment. At, you know, and I, I, there's been times in my life where I haven't been so much and I have this inner monologue and everything like that. But um, especially lately, I've uh, been getting more of a clarity of mind. I feel like I'm kind of resolving into my personality, rediscovering myself and everything. And it's like, I just feel like I'm a part of this world, you know, and immersed into it. Um, and so, yeah, and it's comforting. Like, it makes yeah. it feel like, you know, the things that people are so stressed and worried about just yeah. don't seem as important. And my mom loves to tell the story of when uh, I was a kid and we went to a zoo. I can't remember if it was a Houston zoo or, but anyway, it was one of those places where they had sort of a petting zoo, but it wasn't even just petting. It was it was just like basically you could go in with these like sheep and goats and just sort of hang out with them, you know? Yeah. And oh, we have, yeah, we have one like that in uh, Oregon. I mean, once he was awesome. So I did this and I just sort of so naturally like went, became part of this environment that yeah. I fell asleep on the, this rock <laughs> and uh, when she came back, she went, my mom went somewhere else, you know, I don't know if my brothers were there or whatever, but she wasn't there with me and she came back and I was asleep on the rock and there was like goats, like lying on top of me. Like they just sort of welcomed me into <laughs> the environment, awesome. you know, they're like, we're all just chilling here in the, on the rock, That's you so know? Cool. <laughs> and I can't remember if she said she still had a picture of that or not, but, uh, but if she did, she, I mean, she may not know where it is, but you know, but she'd never forget that image of coming back and seeing, that's Me great. just having been absorbed by the goats, you know, I just <laughs> so easily went into that environment. Well, that that's a good image to end on, and uh, we'll have to, like, do more of this. It's pretty fun. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, my wife uh, is jealous of my time, so we'll like to watch movies. We were catching up on a lot of movies. We caught up on um, the Hobbit movies and Star Wars and everything, so... Well, cool. by all means, enjoy your movie night, and I'm probably going to watch some Unsolved Mysteries myself. So Cool. Say uh, hi to your son. Tell him uh, fellow ESTP. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> maybe maybe he'll pop on one of these times and get it. Yeah, maybe so. The kid's perspective. Cool. All right, man. It's been fun. Have a good night. All right. Talk to you later.